Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a fascinating series on <coughs> themes in the Gospel of John. This is lesson number nine in that series for November 30 of 2024, entitled The Source of Life. The Source of Life. Hmm. We'll see what John has to say about that. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we take up this new subject, as we consider all the different things that John has to say about it, help us to reconnect, if necessary, to the eternal source of life as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Repeatedly in the Gospel of John, Jesus answered the question about his existence by saying that he was or is the I Am. This was clearly a reference back to the statement in Exodus 3, verse 14, when Christ himself said to Moses, I am who I am. So Jesus is speaking to Moses back in his day. Now he's speaking to us or speaking to the people in, in, in Judea in Jesus' day. Uh, okay, that same divine being became a human being and witness to us the truth about God, the Father. And you can see references there. Jesus made a number of statements about who he was. The great I am is one, but not the only description of Jesus. He is also the light of the world, the bread of life, the gate, of the gate and the door for the sheep, the good shepherd and the true vine. One of the most famous passages that uses those, that terminology is found in John 14, six. Jim? John 14, 6, as Jerry just answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me, American Bible Society. That's a pretty straightforward and blunt, blunt statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So what do you believe Jesus was trying to say when he said he was the I am? From the Bible study guide, more than any other gospel writer, John distinguishes himself as the one who refers to the incarnate Son of God as the great I am. This title, as we learned in an earlier lesson, is a divine reference to God. In John's Gospel, Jesus proclaims, for example, I am the way, the truth, and life, John 14, 6. When we walk in the way, who is Jesus? He teaches us his truth that leads to eternal life. Jesus is our way, way to the eternal God. The Father will never cast out anyone who sincerely comes to Him in repentance. From our adult teacher, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. If God, in the form of the human Jesus, the divine Christ, is the only one who has the ability to give us eternal life, shouldn't we cling to Him? Shouldn't that relationship uh, become the most important thing in our lives? Or would we honestly choose Satan's misery and eternal death? Was it because of that statement of Jesus recorded in John 14, 6, which we just read, that in apostolic days, those who followed the instructions and lifestyle of Jesus were called the followers of the way? Because Jesus was not only human, but also divine, he, was, he is, was, the only human being who had, has life in himself. Dwayne? From the writings of Ellen White, still seeking to give a true direction to her, Martha's faith, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life, 1 John 5, 12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Okay, those are words we don't use real often. What does it mean to say original, unborrowed, underived? Not dependent upon an other source. Not dependent on any other source, okay. He didn't... He, he, he exists, comes... He is, from, he, from is, he is, he is he's the source. Before he's not, David, I am. Mm -hmm. Before Moses, no, I am. Before Moses, I am. This yeah. is the great I am. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, in writing his gospel, many years after all these three of the, after the, all three of the synoptic gospels, those that's to be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had been written, John stated with, started with this startling truth that probably everyone has heard many times. Gordon? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, from the Good News Bible. Now, you know that there are denominations still prominent in our day who categorically deny that statement. They want to change it. They want to believe that there is only one God and that Jesus was a son, but not a divine son, and so forth. During his lifetime, Jesus, although he had divine power, never used that power for his own advantage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many people say, well, obviously Jesus lived that nice life because look at him, he was divine. He, had, he could take advantage of all this extra help he had. No, he didn't. However, when he was dead and buried in the tomb, having shown that the result of sin is separation from God, also known as God's wrath, there was no longer any reason for him to hesitate in using his divine power. And he raised himself to life. Myra? Yes, from Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, when the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb saying, thy father calls thee the savior, came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now was proved the truth to his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up, take it again. Now was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and to the rulers, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise up, raise it up, John 10, 17, 18. He's, he's speaking of his body as if it were the temple, isn't he? <clears throat> the idea of everlasting life occurs 17 times in the Gospel of John. These references point to a salvation and existence with God forever, not some spiritual immaterial concept <coughs> like some many people believe. The Greek word zoe, from which we get the term zoology, study of life, appears 36 times in the Greek version of the Gospel of John. That is about one fourth of the uses of that word in the entire New Testament. Zoe most often refers to everlasting life. The one who gave life to humans and in the beginning also has the power to give it again at the resurrection to eternal life. So now we have evidence that God gave life in the beginning. He raised Jesus from the dead. Well, he, 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 Jesus raised himself from the dead. And now that's our best evidence that he will be able to raise us if we, if we die, that he will be able to raise us at the end. He's done it already, several times, many times. And he created in the beginning. Yes. Okay, John 3, 15 and 16, some very familiar, at least one very familiar verse, but in context, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not have life, but will remain under God's punishment. This truth about eternal, and so you can, under, the, under God's punishment, that's, that's another word for God's wrath, um, depending on how you understand that. This truth about eternal life. Unfortunately, most people think God is angry. No, God, God just lets you do uh, and suffer the consequences sure. of, of your Wayward. If, and if you have read through all of Scripture, starting back with Judges, you'll clearly see that that's the nature of God's wrath. This truth about eternal life is represented in many ways in the Gospel of John, many verses there. We don't have time to read all of them. Let us be very clear. Only Christ has the ability to give eternal life. No creature has this ability. No angel, no human being can do that. Any questions about that? I have a comment I do mingle with, uh, I'm sure many of us do, with uh, our Protestant brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I walk with one of them, Bill Bonnell. I said, Bill mm -hmm. says, eternal hell, eternal hell. So I said, hey, so um, who is the source of eternal life, Bill? You're a very learned man. <laughs> so he says, eternal life is only in Jesus. So you're putting Jesus in, the, in hell? That makes no sense. I, eternal life yeah. cannot be in hell. Very simple, no. because eternal life is only in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So important. After that marvelous miracle of feeding the 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, Jesus recognized that his statement about his body being bread and his blood giving life was not understood by most of the people who wanted. What, the, what did they want? They wanted to make him their human king. And, they and there was a reason for that, it's to free them from the Romans. Yes, exactly. I mean, obviously, this man has the ability to do everything we need him to do to help us conquer the Romans. By this, Jesus meant that his life and his death followed by his resurrection were the source of eternal salvation when we correctly understand them and accept them. Ellen White made this profound statement about the spiritual necessity of feeding upon the bread of life, and what does that mean? Okay, Dwayne, is it Dwayne? Jim. Jim, okay. Ellen White says, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as a personal savior, believing that he forgives our sins and that we are complete in him. It is by beholding his love, by dwelling upon it, by drinking it in that we are to become our partakers of his nature. What food is to be, what food is to the body, Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes a part of our being. So Christ is no value to us if we don't know him as a personal savior. The theoretical knowledge will do us no good. We must feed upon him, receive him into the heart so that his life becomes our life. His love, his grace must be assimilated. Ellen White, Design wow. Pages 389, page, paragraph three. That's quite a challenge. We need to ask the question, why did Jesus come to this earth? The Gospels and the rest of the New Testament answer that question in various ways. The most important thing that Jesus accomplished by coming to this earth was to reveal the truth about his Father, God, to us and to the rest of the universe. By accepting this truth, remember, Colossians says, you know, the rest of the universe learns about God, and also in Ephesians chapter 3. The rest of the universe learns about God from what happened here. By accepting this truth, we have the opportunity to reject the selfishness that leads to eternal death and to accept the truth that leads to eternal life. This is what God wants of us. John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life. life in all its fullness. Wow. Good news Bible. Jesus came to this earth to represent the Father, well, to represent God. He promised his disciples that when he left them, he would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with them and bring conviction upon them, as well as upon those to whom they spread the gospel. Dwayne? I am telling you the truth. It is better for you that I go away, because if I do not go, the Helper will not come to you. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin, and about what is right, and about God's judgment. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, and later on the cross, Christ taught the ultimate truth. And this is very, very profound stuff here. Uh, Gordon? From Ellen White in Desire of Ages 753, she says, upon Christ, that's what, as he's on the cross, upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. He was counted as a transgressor. Does that mean he was a sinner? No. Okay, what does it mean he was counted a transgressor? He was treated as a transgressor. Okay, he was treated as a transgressor. God said, 
I need to show you what sin does to people. It separates them from the Father. It separates them from the source of life. And so this is a demonstration. Go ahead. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. <clears throat> All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. <coughs> Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme, but now, that is on the cross, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Okay, now let me interrupt for a second. <coughs> was God there? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so the problem is what? Jesus can't perceive his presence. He can't see his presence, okay? When we want to make that clear. Go ahead. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by men. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Now, I want to interrupt there for a second. What kind of separation is this? Did God abandon Jesus? Why did Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he couldn't see him. Okay, couldn't. okay he couldn't, per he he couldn't, couldn't perceive him. his presence. That's the important point, because this was the, I don't know, quintessential battle of the great controversy. Satan and all his angels were there to trying to get Jesus to either give up and go back to heaven or to sin or to sin in some way, and God and all the angels there to say, no, not, not so, you can't, you can't force him to do anything. He, you have to leave him alone, let him make his own decisions. This is a, this is a real, real all-out battle in the great controversy. And you can see what it says. Go Con ahead. Continuing in Desire of Ages, Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. Up there before it said he couldn't feel the Father's presence. Isaiah 59 verse 2 tells us that sin separates us from God. Okay, and here we have these words. So Jesus is, is experiencing exactly what the wicked will experience at the very end, at the third coming. Now the question, the real question we need to ask ourselves is, so Jesus, he, the fact that he perceived that his father was separated himself from him caused his death. We're going to read it in just a moment. Do we, do we feel so bad when we sin that it almost kills us? That's what, we're, that's what Jesus is trying to say to us here. Go ahead. Continuing in Desire of Ages, it was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made this, that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Okay, when we say broke the heart, what does that mean? Separated him from God, killed him. That's what killed him. So now, up there it said what? He could hardly, this agony that his, uh, so great was this agony, the fact that he couldn't perceive his father's presence was so great that his physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, what had happened to him so far? He'd been beaten within an inch of his life. Yeah, and so many crown thorns on his head, and now he's crucified and so forth. But that's not what mattered to him. What mattered to him was what? Separation. He couldn't perceive the presence of his father. Okay, now we're going to come to the answer to that. Jesus survived and became the victor by relying upon the evidence previously shown him by the Father. 
Because what do we call that? No human senses could perceive it at either the Garden of Gethsemane or on the cross, but Jesus relied upon the evidence previously given to him by his Father. And then here's the key passage and answer to that. From Desire of Ages, page 756. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs of the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence his father's, of his father's acceptance heretofore given him. Okay, what do we call relying upon the evidence? There's another word for that. That's faith. So Jesus exercised his faith in his father. Even though he couldn't perceive the father's presence, he relied on, the, on what he knew about his father. Okay, go ahead. What he had previously, you know, previously learned. Yeah. And including communication in prayer. So in other, in other words, no, no, no matter what the devil was trying to tempt him, no matter what the devil was trying to do to him, Jesus said, I'm sorry, I know the Father. And he's like this, he's not like what you're trying to tell me. Okay? He was acquainted with the character of his Father. He understood his justice, his mercy, his great love. By faith, he rested in him who it had been his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was the victor. Okay, so how did he win? By faith in what he knew. He, by committing himself and absolutely refusing to allow anything the devil tried to do to him to say, I'm sorry, I know my father, and I refuse to accept any false ideas about my father. That's called exercising faith. Thus Jesus died the second death that is a direct result of sin and separation from God. He demonstrated the death that, was, that we all deserve to die if we refuse to separate from our sins. Have we learned the primary lesson Jesus came to teach the universe? Do we know the Father? Do we know what, Jesus, what God's character is like? Do we know that God the Father is just like Jesus? Well, we have some passages. So I want to emphasize one point. So it's not just teaching us here on this earth, but it's teaching the whole universe that Jesus came for. Yes. And what would he teach the universe from his experience here that he couldn't teach the universe before? These are very important points. Let's, let's nail them down. This was the place where it was demonstrated how God dealt with rebellion. And sin, I mean, you can call it sin, you can call it rebellion, whatever you like. This was a demonstration, okay, what is God? It's, it's, I mean, if everybody's loving and kind and there's no problems at all, almost anybody can look like a good guy. But what happens when someone directly attacks your character? What happens when they make all kinds of accusations against you? Then what do you do? Well, John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is the same as God is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. Jim, Helen White had some words about that. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling His glory, humbling Himself, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding the record of his own condescending grace. Amen. In every, every, excuse me, in every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear the rec and recognize God in sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movement of the Father. Ellen White, letter. <laughs> I don't know how I could say it any, any clearer than that. I mean, this is God acting here on this earth. Okay. John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus answered, For a long time I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, show us the Father, good news Bible? If we know Jesus, then we know what the Father is like. God is just like Jesus. Yeah.
So how do you understand the following words? We got lots of references here because this is a really important material. Go ahead, Duane. So Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you obey my teaching, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What does that mean? You know the truth that will set you free? Truth about what? Oh yeah, how does that, that's what I'm asking. How does that work? Well, yeah, you know. I remember what did he say in uh, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15? Those who through fear of death are in a lifelong bondage. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite of freedom, is it not? Okay, so if you know the truth, knowing the truth means to know God, then and if you know God, you will love Him. You will want to do His will. That means if you want to do God's will, then you can do whatever you want. You are free. You won't want to do something that's opposed to God. So that's what this verse is talking about. We can be free as soon as we, as soon as we only want to do what God wants us to do. Okay, faith comes to us by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Ellen White from Fundamentals of Christian Education said, the Bible opens to us the words of life for it makes us acquainted with Christ, who is our life. In order to have life, abiding faith in Christ, we must know Him as He is represented in the world. The Word. In the Word. Faith is trustful. It is not a matter of fits and starts, according to the impulse and emotion of the hour, but it is a principle that has its foundation in Jesus Christ and faith must be kept in constant exercise through the diligent, persevering study of the Word. The Word thus becomes a living agency, and we are sanctified through the truth. Sanctified through the truth. That is, we learn to love God, we choose to do His will, because that's what we want to do. Ellen White, Myra? Yes. Under the inspiration of the Spirit, the Apostle Peter, represents Christians as those who have purified their souls in obeying the truth. Just in accordance with the faith and love we bring to our work will be the power brought into it. No man can create faith. The spirit operates upon the enlightening. The human mind creates faith in God. In the scriptures, Faith is stated to be a gift of God, powerful unto salvation, enlightening the hearts of those who search for truth as for a hidden treasure. The Spirit of God impresses the truth on the heart. The gospel is called the power of God unto salvation because God alone can make the truth a power which sanctifies the soul. He alone can render the cross of Christ triumphant. Now, we could spend a lot of time discussing that. <clears throat> Let me try to say it in the words that I understand. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot do anything to make ourselves fit for the kingdom of heaven. The only thing we can do is open our, open our minds to the outworking, the, the, the influence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and they are the ones who can change us. Okay, let's see if we can work on that some more. Faith is not, this is again from Ellen White, faith is not the ground of our salvation, but it is the great blessing, the eyes that, the eye that sees, the ear that hears, the feet that run, the hand that grasps. It is the means, not the end. If Christ gave his life to save sinners, why should I not take that blessing? My faith grasps it, and thus my faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Thus, resting and believing, I have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Jim? The humanistic approach to faith states that we must find a foundation, a criteria for our faith, and then believe. In contrast, the biblical approach states that faith is the foundation, a gift from God. Ephesians 2.8, 1 Corinthians 1. 17 to 24 and 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 6. 
we start with the foundation of faith, and then from there, we grow in understanding and grace. It is often believed that we must first repent and confess our sins, then we can accept salvation through faith. However, faith and repentance are both gifts from God. Charles? <coughs> John wrote his gospel so that we would believe in Jesus and that by believing we may have eternal life in his name, John 20, 31. In John 1, 12 and 13, this process is described in two steps. First, we receive him, that is, believe in him. Second, he gives us authority to power or power to become God's children. Um, Themes in John chapter 9, okay, that's described in verse 13 as being begotten of God. Thus, there is a human and divine aspect of becoming a Christian. We must act in belief, receive Him, and be open to the light. But He is the one who regenerates the heart. So At that's... Yeah. Sabbath school uh, quarterly. That's what I suggested a little while ago. It is letting God, we have the choice, we have to make the choice, but it is God who can, who can um, make the changes. Paul recognized how strange and almost unbelievable his message was by using the following words. Dwayne? 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 24. Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to tell the good news and to tell it without using the language of human wisdom in order to make sure that Christ's death on the cross is not robbed of its power. <clears throat> For the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost. But for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. Let me interrupt for just a second. Um, you notice there it says Isaiah 29, 14, LXX Septuagint. So this is evidence that the uh, Bible writers, a number of them, especially John late, very late writing somewhere around 8090, was often referring to the Greek New Testament known as the Septuagint. So it's a little different than the Hebrew, but here he is quoting the Greek New Testament. Go ahead. So the Greek then, Old Testament. I'm sorry, thank you, Greek Old Testament. So then, where does that leave the wise, or the scholars, or the skillful debaters of the world? God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God in His wisdom made it pos impossible for people to know Him by means of their own wisdom. Instead, by means of the so-called foolish message we preach, God decided to save those who believe. Jews want miracles for proof, and Greeks look for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ, a message that is offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. But for those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, Think about people like the Greeks. They have all, and they had all these rules for logic and all that kind of stuff, and even the Hebrews as well. The idea that you could win by dying, I mean, come on now. Who wins by dying? You lose by dying. So here's, here's someone who is crucified as a traitor against the Roman government. He dies, and you're telling me he's the winner? You know, you can see how people would say, come on now, this is, this is foolishness. So who could possibly believe that someone actually won the great controversy by dying? If someone were to ask you what your faith is based on, how would you respond? Unfortunately, not everyone responded in the appropriate way to Jesus and his teachings. Some rejected the light. Gordon? John 1, 5, and then 10 through 11. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. Verse 10, the word was in the world, and through God, no, though God, and though God made the world through him, 
yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own country, but his own people did not receive him. Good News Bible. And I always want to stop when I read those words. There's no word there for country or people in that verse. It says literally, he came to his own and his own rejected him. There's no country, no people right there. You have to decide. And my experience is, I, I spent many years in East Africa where Swahili was the, was the primary language. And it's a language about a third of it comes from Arabic, which in turn comes from Hebrew. Much of it comes from Hebrew. And if you say to somebody, come to mine, what do you suppose that means? Come to mine. That's what they would say in their language. That means you come to my house, my place. See, And so what this is really saying, Jesus came to his, his home and his family. I mean, to be considerate, you should probably say Jesus should came to, you should say Jesus came to his family and his family came to his home and his family rejected him. That's the way it really should be read, I, I think. Unfortunately, our modern world has come to believe that the way to approach truth is to question everything until you have proven w whether or not it is true. And here's a statement from some people who helped to write this particular Bible study guide. Um, the contemporary humanistic way of thinking begins with doubt. People question everything in order to determine what is truth. That which survives the fire of cross-examination, they accept as rock-solid knowledge, something on which to place one's faith. Some apply the same method to the Bible, calling everything into question from the scientific, historical, psychological, philosophical, and archaeological <laughs> or geological perspective in order to determine what is truth in the Bible. The very method itself starts with and builds upon doubt in the veracity of Scripture. Christ asked, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8. Okay. Do you see evidence in Scripture that Jesus is, was the divine Messiah? in contrast to the mistake that so many make, leaving, leading to death by rejecting the evidence in Scripture? In, November, in Numbers 13, 23 to 33, we read about the response of the people to the reports brought back by the 12 Israelite spies who visited Canaan. You remember that 10 of the spies said, oh, it, you know, there's no way we can conquer this. They have cities with big high walls and they, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes, etc. But the two, Caleb and Joshua, said, no, God has promised us this land and we can conquer it. Anyway, God had already told the people that he would take them into that land. But they chose to believe the false reports of the ten spies. So who decides on which side each one of us is going to find ourselves? John 3, 18 through 21. This is right after that famous verse, John 3, 16. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light will not come to the light because they do not want the evil deeds to be shown up. But those who are those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So how does the judgment work? If we're in the habit of doing evil things, we're going to be trying to hide from the light. If we're in the habit of doing the right kind of things, we're going to come to the light. We make the choice. If we choose to reject the words of Jesus, we are choosing to condemn ourselves. And there's a bunch of verses there, John 3, John 5, John 8, John 12. Consider the story of Eve. Her human senses 
suggested to her that she should try the fruit. After all, it seemed to have given the serpent the ability to speak. She thought that the loving God she had come to know would not reject or destroy her for simply tasting the fruit, and Adam followed her example. So why do so many people choose the wrong instead of the right? Okay, there's all you're going to give me an answer to that question, right? <laughs> why do so many people choose the wrong instead of the right? It's the easy way. It's because they are drawn by the naturally selfish approach that Satan himself took in heaven. But we know what the end of that approach will be. Romans 6. Jim, I think that's yours. For sin wages wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Good News Bible. Do you agree with the views expressed in the following from the Bible Study Guide? BSG, Bible Study Guide, somehow over fallaciously argue that there was no real need for Christ to come to this world. But who else could have taken our sins away and clothed us in the robe of God's righteousness? Who else could have given us life in the place of our death? No one but the all-righteous and all-life-giving Christ. He valiantly fought our two most deadly enemies, sin and death, and conquered both. His victory becomes ours when we truly believe in him. Thus, we can trust Jesus when he promises, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. John 6, 40, New King James. Hello. Okay, let's look at that verse, Duane. <clears throat> For what my Father wants is that all who see the Son and believe in him should have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. Is that complicated? Is that difficult? Sounds pretty simple. How, 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 do we, how do we see this son? He's displayed all through Scripture, right? Mm -hmm. So if we read and study and understand the Scripture, and what are we doing? We are, we are becoming acquainted with God, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the role of logic and reasoning and choosing what is right? Do we have adequate evidence that the Bible should be trusted? So there we're talking about adequate evidence. The Bible should be trusted. Let us be very clear and blunt. If we have everything in the world but have not Jesus, we are lost. Matthew 6.33, instead be concerned about everything else, above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you. And he will provide you with all these other things from the Good News Bible. Okay, and what do we have even from the Old Testament, Myra? The psalmist reassures us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, Psalms 23, 1. In other words, when we have the Lord as our priority, he provides for our needs. The Lord knows well what we truly need in life, and he is happy to do right by us. But his top priority is for us to have a saving relationship with him. Okay, now the famous verse we know in Psalms 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. Okay, how does that work? Can I go home and say I trust in God and he will provide housing and clothing and food and... Only if you have a true relationship with him. Okay, I'm, I'm asking how that works. What you oh. see, what you hear, what you... Spend your time on should be top priority, huh? Yeah. All you need is a relationship with God. Everything else is superfluous. Well, I wouldn't say superfluous. It may be necessary, but it's not as important as having a relationship with God. Well, Job had a relationship with, and Job knew that he was right of all things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Despite the accusations <laughs> of all his friends, he right? He knew I am right, but he suffered. 
Okay, here's my next question. I want you to think about this. Do you feel that the disciples, in their association with Jesus, they lived with them and walked with them for some of them for three and a half years? Jesus had an advantage, his disciples in association with Jesus Christ had advantage over those of us who only have access to the written words of Jesus? Would have loved to be there at the time, but uh, we yeah. have a bigger picture that some of them perhaps did not. Okay, so we have more, a bigger picture than they did. What does that mean? The plan of salvation. Uh, from the great controversy, maybe that's okay. Put it. We have a clearer and more complete picture of God, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and by the way, the only one who saw Jesus in his real divine beauty before the cross was a woman, and she was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. So it does not take a big scientist or whatever. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a shocking question How many of the disciples owned a copy of the Bible? None. None. Not one. I mean, this it, in those days it had to be copied by hand on expensive, either papyrus or skins. Very, very, very expensive. And if they, even if they'd had like the copy of one book or something, how could they carry it around with them everywhere they, everywhere they went? Only one way: have it memorized. Yeah. Okay. And so many of them did that, fortunately, but. What do we have today? When we're looking at these computers, we can, I can, if I don't like what one, one version of the Bible says, I can look at a different one. I can compare them. I can say, you know, which, which makes better sense and so forth. Okay, so Ellen White said, I think this must be mine. The word of the living God is not merely <laughs> written, but spoken. The Bible is God's voice speaking to us just as surely as though we could hear it with our ears. If we realize this, with what awe would we open God's Word and with what earnestness would we search the precept, its precepts? The reading and contemplation of the Scriptures would be regarded as an audience with the Infinite One. Mm -hmm. Testimonies, Volume 6, 393. The reading and contemplation of the Scriptures would be regarded as an audience with the Infinite One. So it's like being in the presence of Jesus. Absolutely. In our day, we do not have the privilege of seeing Jesus or hearing Jesus in person. However, we do have His words and the words of His followers. These words of the Bible are effectively God speaking to us. Jim? Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. 4, 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, I'm sorry. What shall we say then of Abraham, the father of our race? What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the, thing, excuse me, by the things he did, he would have something to boast about, but not in God's sight. The scripture says Abraham believed, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Those who work are paid wages, but they are not regarded as a gift. They are something that we have been, excuse me, that has been earned. But those who depend on faith, not on deeds, and who believe in the God who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is his faith that God takes into account in order to put him right with himself. This is what David meant when he spoke of the happiness of the person whom God accepts as righteous apart from things, excuse me, from anything that the person does. Happy are those who, whose wrongs are forgiven, whose sins are pardoned. Happy is the person whose sins the Lord will not keep account of. Good news Bible. Okay. Now there's some pretty incredible statements made there. But Let's if a person's <coughs> sins are forgiven, what does that what does that accomplish? That means the good person got away with it. Rather than this changing his thinking and learning to think that Jesus yeah. that which is So let's look at that. God's mind is, is learn to think like Jesus. Romans four one through eight, talking about the experience of Abraham, teach us that faith is a gift from God. There are other scriptures that seem to give a slightly different approach. How do you explain the apparent contradiction between Paul's words above 
and James's words in James 2, 18 to 24. Charles? But someone will say, well, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with it. <laughs> it puts you in a great group, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. You fool. Do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? How was our an ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Can't you see? His faith and his actions worked together. His faith was made perfect through his actions. And the scripture came true that said, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham was called God's friend. You see then, that is by people's action that they are put right with God and not by their faith alone. Oh dear now, <laughs> do we have a conflict between James and Paul? Well, superficially, it definitely looks like that, doesn't it? Yes. So how are we going to put these two together? Even repentance is a gift from God, for it is a response to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to submit to Him. Many make the mistake of waiting first to have both faith and, be and to believe and repentance to, to come to God. But these twin gifts are already there, awaiting our reception and application. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt for just a second. You didn't answer my question. How are we going to fit James with Paul? Well, Luther could not. So who are we? He, he <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, Luther had a big problem with this, and he proceeded to throw out five books. Yes. He didn't. He wasn't sure what to do with them. So just throw them out. Well, he put them at the end of his New Testament as a kind of apocrypha to the New Testament. Well, in fact, we have the time. Luther was, you know, I mean, we would want to throw him out of church because he said the only way to baptize a Jew, a Jew. is to take him, grab him by his neck and put tie, him tie outside. A, tie a stone around his neck and well, drop and him into the river. the highest bridge in Germany Over the river and Elf. toss him saying, I now baptize you in the name of our father Abraham. And this is well, Luther. We, he was a human the, being, by the way, just like you and us. And some other things, as, as, as wonderful as Luther was and, this, and so forth, had a, we need to remember that his favorite drink was beer, by <laughs> far. That was his. That's thing. less of a sin than tossing the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> baptizing the Jew from the top of the ridge. Okay, the but now let's, co let's come back here. We know that Paul didn't, uh, that, I'm sorry, that Luther didn't like James. Are we, gonna th are we gonna throw out some books? We're gonna throw out some books of the New Testament? No. How are we gonna put these together? Maybe we're gonna have to leave that with you out there, try to figure it out because we're running out of time here. Um, go ahead. There is no need to wait in order to receive them. Peter and the apostles affirmed this reality in Acts 5.31. Him, Christ, God has exalted to his right hand to be the prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. So why does the sinner need to wait any longer? Come to Christ with the faith he has given you and receive his gift of repentance to live his life today. Okay, Acts from, 5, our, from our Bible study guide. Yes. So, Acts 5, 31, Dwayne. God raised him, Jesus, to his right hand side as leader and savior to give the people of Israel the opportunity to repent and to have their sins forgiven. Okay, does that mean we can't have our sins forgiven unless Jesus is at the right-hand side of God? A lot of people would say, well, they, unless Jesus is up there pleading with the Father, I don't have a ghost of a chance. Is that what's being said here? 
No. Each one of us chooses for ourselves what the results of our lives will be. Will we be motivated by selfishness? And whose example is that? Satan. Satan. That was Satan, Lucifer. Or by love. Okay, and we come to John 3, 18 to 21. From the Good News Bible, those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Good News Bible. Wow, okay. So we're uh, running out of time. Go ahead. Do you want to summarize? Well, we've seen a number of things in this lesson. Um, we've seen that God says, okay, he comes to us and he says, oh, what side are you going to choose to be on? Are you going to choose to do what is right? Or are you going to choose to do what is wrong? Are you going to choose to do the selfish thing? Or are you going to do, choose to do the loving thing? And those who choose to do the loving thing, they will fit in heaven. Those who choose to do the selfish thing, God doesn't, you know, doesn't punish them. He just says, I'm sorry, you would, you, if, you went, if we took you to heaven, you'd just start the great controversy all over again. It's, it's not safe to take you to heaven. So God wants to make these changes in our lives. All we have to do is give him permission to come in and do what needs to be done. We do not have the ability to make those changes ourselves. All we have the ability to do is to choose. We have the power to choose. Choose to do the right, choose not to do the wrong. And then God says, okay, if you choose to do, if we choose to do Satan's side, he'll be happy to mess things up for us. But if we choose, choose to do God's side, um, he says, I can do everything that, that's needed here. Your sins don't matter. Uh, I can take care of them. Um, they're part of the history, but they're, they, can be, they can be dealt with. So we have a God who wants to save us, who is willing to save us, and wants to welcome us into his kingdom. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, as we turn once again to you and see these steps, spelled out quite clearly in scriptures in the Gospel of John. Help us to take advantage of them, to live the kind of lives you want us to live so that we may be free, free because we will only want to do what you want us to do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.